Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Jeff Schulenberger, and this is Compact Conversations, the podcast where I sit down with one of Compact's contributors each week to discuss one of our articles. This week, I'm joined by Alex Perez, aka the Iowa Pariah of, of viral fame last year, has written two pieces for us to date, most recently on the this year's uh, prize nominations. It's literary prize season. So he is he's weighed in on on what's going on with the literary prize scene and uh, offered a sort of in depth account of of one uh, extremely celebrated book called Chain Gang All Stars. So we will get into that. Uh, thanks for joining me, Alex. Thanks, Jeff. Happy to be here. So uh, yeah, I did look into this book. It it's kind of if you go to the publishing page as as you discussed at the beginning, it's like the number of accolades is almost absurd it's it's like I, I, yeah, what's funny with these books are is that yeah the way they're framed when you pick them up initially you can tell that they're almost framed in a way that makes it impossible for a critic to even like go against all this praise and i know that you know blurb Row was like that but some of these like you know poc books that are like you know end up putting on the awards you pick them up and it's like if i even go against all these you know george saunders everybody else like that like puts me as just like you know once again you're just like Oh, what kind of pariah? So, like, if you look at like all the reviews, like every single review of these books is like it's the greatest book ever. And obviously, it's for different reasons. But I think it starts with like this like murderer's row of like you know twenty five blurbs from all the great American writers and critics. So it becomes impossible to even you know go at these books like in a kind of honest kind of way. I think. I think I'd seen this book around. I'd seen the title, but I hadn't really looked into it. But yeah, when you go to the site, when you go to the website of the publisher, it's like, it's really like, it takes a while to scroll down through all the accolades, right? Part of what we're talking about here, I mean, the piece is called Why the Literary Elite Loves POC Pain. And, you know, what, what we're talking about here is the profile of a particular type of book that that often garners these kinds of accolades. And it tends to be a book about uh, suffering written by an author who, you know, checks certain demographic boxes. This particular book, I would just say, is by a, a debut novelist who previously had a short story collection that I think was also highly acclaimed. And it's kind of an exemplary figure in, in your piece for this broader phenomenon. Yeah, I think like every year you have like one or two of these books that kind of is about this kind of POC kind of suffering. They kind of get, you know, propped up as this great American American writer, but I think with this book, I saw it bigger than any other book like in the last probably like maybe like 10 years where it was like, he was with the Jenna, you know, morning shows. He was like an Esquire. He's, it's been this incredible, like, you know, PR blitz, which, uh, which is great for him and for the agent, you know, I tip my hat to them, but it's almost like this incredible groundwork being laid for like once when you're a critic and you pick up this book, it becomes impossible to kind of have that kind of frame because you might do the obvious thing and praise it, or the other side, you might just trash it because you don't want to praise it, you know, so because impossible even from both sides. And with this book, I think is, it's kind of really like indicative of like the publishing world where if you look at all these books, that get this massive praise, like every single critic from like all the legacy magazines are all white critics. And if you get like a critical review, it's from a POC writer. So, the, so, so, so even that framing is kind of weird. We're like, if you're like a heterodox POC writer, you might be the only voice who will like go against some of these like big POC books. It's always like in this kind of like framing that you kind of can't get out of. Like if you're this like POC writer, either you write the sad POC story or you become kind of this like heterodox POC voice. So you really can't leave this framing. I think it's, if you're like a POC writer like now, it's almost impossible to get out of this framing because of the way that the publishing world is, that these books are ca- catering to a certain audience that either really loves these POC suffering books, or they've been kind of told that they're supposed to like them. So it becomes real difficult if you're writing fiction to kind of get away from that. And if you're a critic, you're a POC critic, it becomes almost like impossible to, you know, to like be like your own kind of voice because you got to kind of choose sides. So you really can't kind of like leave this kind of framing that they created, which is if you go to all these books, it's like every single time it's the same kind of story, say the same critics say the same things, and it's impossible to be critical, I think, in an honest way. You know, when you go back in literary history, there are sort of, you know, various periods where there's an emphasis on diversifying the voices represented and so on. Um, So this isn't, you know, this isn't totally new. 
And clearly there, there's sort of, you know, at least some pressure. And th- this wouldn't even just apply to whatever authors of color as they're now defined, but say to like authors representing particular, you know, like Jewish American authors or Italian American authors or something like that. There would be kind of a tendency to like corral them into representing certain kinds of narratives, certain kinds of settings. So and then, you know, what's interesting is like when I think of black, you know, black American literature, in the 20th century, you already had these debates going like in the middle of the century, right? So you had sort of James Baldwin critiquing Richard Wright's native son and kind of critiquing the protest novel in a way that the expect. And, you know, it's interesting because Baldwin is kind of a, a figure who people love to cite, you know, in favor of all kinds of social justice causes. But he was quite sort of critical of the the idea that, you know, black writers should just write about black suffering in America and racism, even though he did write about those things. But he also wrote novels that had like no black, you know, no major black characters. And then you had, you know, Ralph Ellison as well, kind of critiquing, you know, African-American literature as it, as it then existed as kind of, you know, pigeonholing authors into this position. And so it's it's interesting to me that like in a way this phenomenon is is quite old. It's it's been going on for a while and there have been these kind of tensions and you know one thing that strikes me you're saying now is that in a way the, the I mean the group think is much greater like you had these figures like Baldwin or Ellison who were quite critical of what was kind of expected of them by by publishers I think. And you know now you're saying it's it seems as if you're saying like as soon as you criticize that you're sort of yeah. But I was thinking about this piece. I went back to yeah. I went to Sherman Alexi and Juno Diaz. Were probably like recent writers like in the '90s. They like brought in like this new kind of like you know these like POC voices. So like Juno Diaz, Sherman Alexi, they were obviously writing about diverse topics, but they weren't framed around whiteness. Obviously, they were about white characters and, you know, growing up in the American Republic, growing up on the you know, reservation. So they were tackling these topics, but they were allowed a wider berth in their writing because obviously we hadn't had all this new lingo that we have now. So if you like Gino's early stories, obviously they're talking about, you know, race and diversity, all these things, but like in a way where you can tell that he's not really thinking about these things that writers are now so obsessed with. So, the, so these stories might have the same kind of, you know, quote unquote themes, but it's a lot wider berth that you had as a writer. Like they weren't really thinking about. And then you can see like into the, into the 2010s, like there was this writer named Nam, Nam Lee, Vietnamese writer. He was this massive writer, won all the awards. I think it was 2010 that he won all the awards. Now he's vanished, but he was a Vietnamese writer, all the acclaim, a you know, new like POC voice. And if you look at his book, he wrote maybe one or two stories from a Vietnamese point of view. The rest of the stories were about, you know, women and white men. And like, so, so he actually tried to tackle different point of views, which, which is great. And the book got massive praise and it did great. Like, I can't imagine that happening now. So it feels like, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, things really took a turn where that if you were like a person of color, you had to strictly write these kind of trauma based kind of stories. And it feels now that like, we're probably, you know, 10, 15 years into this scene. And I hear from so many writers who don't want to write these kind of stories, but they know that the incentives say, if you write these stories, you win the awards, you get the fellowships. When you bring up these topics, people always assume that you say, oh, you want the white male writers to come back. I'm not saying that. I want, and that's fine too. I want the POC writers to be allowed to have that wider birth that the earlier writers had. That now it's like, if you go to an agent, they want these like trauma stories and like all the writers know that going to the MFA, going to the conferences. So right now it's probably worse than ever where if you're a person of color, you must kind of write these really trauma heavy based stories that just stay with your identity. Like you can't even get out of it. Like every year I see the list. I'm like, okay, like this year it might get better. And you know, these like lists drop and like, oh my goodness, like it's even worse this year. So we're still like in this scene where like MFA programs, like writers know if you go to a workshop, this is what's kind of expected. So it starts from there and it keeps on going. And then we get these stories where you pick up these books and you want something that's not, you can have trauma, obviously it's fiction, it's art that can be there, but you want something else that's not just geared toward the trauma that the elite white audience wants. There are a few different uh, parts of this machinery it might be worth taking in, in separate you know, analyses. So you have the MFA programs and the publishing houses. I think you have you know, a lot of internal pressure within these institutions to kind of diversify in various ways and to kind of check certain boxes. It's like whenever there's some bad thing that happens, right, that 
that initiates some conversation and that's a term you use in the piece, uh, you know, conversation about race or social justice or whatever, like there's pressure for, for all institutions to in some way respond to that. And so whenever they are able to, you know, publish a book or award a residency or, a, you know, admit a student who in some way can be seen as part of that like symbolic mission, then, then they're sort of, okay, we're fulfilling these promises we've made in these like inane statements that we've had to <laughs> make to, to sort of appease parties within our institution. It seems like that's one piece of the puzzle here, the sort of pressure cooker of, you know, how these institutions have come to function, you know, just means that like, it's it's not even just that they get to pat themselves on the back. It's that they're, they're kind of like using these various things to like show that they're doing the work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in I Writers Workshop from 07 to 09, so we're talking 12, 13 years ago now. And when I was there, there was no talk of any of this in a workshop. Like that all came like early, early 2010. So I was really able to see how the institutions kind of, you know, talked about writing where like, I remember being in a workshop and there might've been 95% talk of craft, which is like pretty amazing. Now from what I've heard, it's like, you know, maybe 40% craft talk if you're lucky. So, you know, once these like, you know, once all this cultural turmoil happened in institutions, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, like everything changed. Like if you were in an MFA program, you were in this part of campus where you can just talk about art and talk about books and you were kind of safe. And like once that left, cause like I remember I heard about Alio after I left and I was shocked that on a far side of campus, it's like part of the school, but it's not. So I was amazed that even there, like this kind of stuff like came in and that's what's happened. Like if you're the top talented writers, and you're going to these schools and like automatically you learn how to talk about writing in a certain way, write a certain way. Then the agents come in and they talk the same way. Then it's almost impossible to kind of deviate from that kind of script. And that's what's happened. I mean, I would say 2012, 2013, like that was the beginning. And then now uh, and we're still there. And it creates this kind of scene where, like I said, that I hear from so many writers who are, want to write what they want to write about, but they know like the incentives aren't there. Cause like, even me, like I wrote, I was a novelist fiction writer for a long time. And I knew once I stopped writing the little POC safe stories that I used to write, I would lose all these kind of nice little perks. So like once everything is tied up from like academia, conferences, residencies, everything is, and it's not a conspiracy, but it's the same people in all the fields. And once that happens, then everything is flattened. I know writers who became agents, but it's the same person from the same kind of school. So it's the same kind of person in all the institutions. And once that happens, it's very hard for one person to say, okay, I'm going to change the script because all my friends are kind of on the same script. And that's what's happened. It's impossible almost if you're a writer, unless you go on Substack, almost impossible. And writers are waiting. I guarantee every year, the writers are waiting to see these lists, hoping that this year it's a more balanced list. And when it's not, they're like, oh, oh well, I got to keep writing sad stories. You know, one thing I've observed, maybe it's most pronounced in like young adult literature that this kind of thing happens, but you've seen it elsewhere that... It, it seems like there have been some books that try to address some of these issues, but maybe in a more nuanced way or like a more ambiguous way. Or it's like an author who might be an author of color, but who like writes about a different group that isn't their own. Those often have been the source of a lot of controversy, right? That like when somebody tries to approach these things with a little bit of nuance, then they get savaged by these like mobs of, of enraged people. We're seeing some of these books now. And it's interesting because... I want to see more of those books, but they're still almost stuck in the same kind of framing. It's always the same audience. So it's touchy because like I'm in Miami. So let's say I want to write like a real like kind of Miami novel. I know my readership is going to be an elite white readership because that's who is literary fiction. So you're always stuck in this kind of framing. So what I want to see are writers who stop thinking in that. Even these books now, they're still kind of tied up with that. They're kind of trying to you know react against, but they're still in that framing. These books get massive hate now because... I'm not sure if they're getting less hate, but with the fact that they're still getting hate to me is awful. Because here you have like, yeah, a person of color trying to resist how they're pigeonholed and they still get, I'm not sure where that's going to go, but I think it's a longer timeline than people think. We're going to see like every year, maybe now one or two of these books that are metafictionally pushing back on this. But I think like you have people that are so invested in this kind of mindset of keeping writers kind of in this little kind of, and look, people get uncomfortable. If you talk about this, you know, race and class stuff, they really do. Like I had a thing last week with the Hobart interview, thing went viral and I'm a Cuban guy from Miami. I dare to question some of this stuff. I was called a fascist. I was called a white supremacist. If you dare even question this kind of literary world. So like there is this massive pressure online that writers know is there still. And even if it's starting to, you know, pull back like a tiny bit, 
it's still not enough, I think. Like, I think we're still years away from like writers being able to just write these kind of stories that, that are about where they're from in an honest way that isn't going to make editors uncomfortable. And to me, that's the big problem. The agents and the editors, they might have good intentions, but they come from a really cloistered environment. And they, I think many of them don't know how to deal with like working class POC stories. They really don't. They get really like, they won't say it out loud, but they get physically uncomfortable. And I think that's a thing that people don't want to talk about for obvious reasons. But I think like they do get uncomfortable because I remember I had a novel go out 2013, 2014. So it wasn't at the peak of what we have now where people would say, okay, like you can't write this. But I had some responses to my novel that were basically these people are behaving badly, but they're Cubans in Miami. So I can't kind of say that. They were made uncomfortable. Now what's happened, people will actually say that, okay, these are bad POC characters. So that has changed. And so I think that has to go away first. And then writers can actually write honest fiction. But now like, yeah, like I see it all the time. Like I'll write a piece and I'm like, man, like this is a person who's like a quote unquote liberal person is made very uncomfortable by these characters. I mean, you brought up Juno Diaz as an example of somebody, you know, who I think he was canceled in a strange way. He, I guess, somehow like towed the line where he could get away with a certain level of that. You know, that having characters who had certain attributes that would like make bourgeois white ladies <laughs> uncomfortable or whatever. But he he somehow managed to play that uh, to his advantage. But 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 it seems like he sort of lasted a bit too long. Early, early Juno. So pre, so like pre like me too. So we're talking like Drown, the first Calo short story collection to me. Every year, like I'll read that book because I still love that book. And what's incredible there is that you couldn't get those stories published now because they're like gritty in a way that's kind of almost abrasive for even me. So I think what happened in that era, you had a, had a base of editors who were truly people who like literary fiction and that's gone. Like to me, that's the most obvious thing that you had people who were truly open minded and diverse people who were working and publishing. And some are still in there that have somehow kind of not gotten fired or not just quiet, but like, like I see early Juno. And that's what I see there. These are people who wanted diverse voices, honestly, because they thought these stories that hadn't been seen in a long time were fascinating. And that's what was in publishing. And there has been a turnover over the last 25 years where people who truly were progressive and open-minded and love books have been kind of pushed out of publishing. Things have gotten far more narrow. Because like, I can't imagine like some of the people who buy books, like I see them talking about books and they don't really like books sometimes. Or it's this really narrow way, probably to about 2011, 2012, these people in publishing who actually liked books, they were still vocal and had a power. And I think for the last 10, 12 years, like, and what's sad is like many of them are still there. I hear from them. I talk to them. They're still in publishing. It's just, they're obviously, they don't like it fired. People assume when you say that, that these are right wing people. No, no. These are progressive, you know, liberal people who just have been shut down by crazy people. Suddenly, I thought one reason it was a good example, this chain gang all stars is it's like, it's basically set in this kind of dystopian prison future where people are engaged in this kind of gladiatorial combat for entertainment and it's broadcast on TV. Like, in pri- you know, people in prison are and then they they are able to uh, get out of prison by by winning these these contests, as I as I understand it. Part of what was kind of interesting subtly in your piece is that, you know, your piece is kind of about the like the way this kind of often quite vicious like jockeying for status happens. I mean, it, it ultimately is quite a you know nasty and, and brutal game right that's played in these institutions as, as genteel as they are yeah i mean there's a writer last year who had a, a really big book of stories and uh he's from miami uh jonathan escoffrey he was so i guess he was the big like poc voice of last year so he read in miami last year and i went good book not great if you read the reviews you think it's the greatest thing ever fine book good book but i went to the reading and when you go to the readings, you really see the makeup of the literary world. I'm in Miami, so it's not very white at all. But if you go to the reading there, it was all mostly younger, young ladies, white, and some of his family who didn't read the book. Like they were laughing there saying, Oh, we didn't read it. So like you can really see like, and like writers who are writing these books, they know what they're doing. And I'm not going to like say don't do it because it's obviously good business, but it is a very, very vicious way of like, even the picture of the piece you put up. Great picture. You get this, you know, Jenna Bush there. There's like, you know, powerful. Like, I mean, it's a weird kind of, you know, you are like, if you write these stories, there is a lot that you can gain. I think people in the literary world, they're so angry because they know it's vicious, but how dare you say it out loud? And when you say like these things out loud, these really, really obvious things, then people get really mad because there are like not many spots available. And like, if you want one of these spots, you'd probably be smart to write these kind of really sad 
stories that most likely, you know, rich women are going to be reading. And it's a really kind of dark and kind of depressing kind of thing that everybody knows and nobody talks about unless it's this private chat. I think what's interesting too is like you have all these critics that kind of do the same thing, which obviously I don't blame the writers for trying to get all the prizes. I mean, trying to, I mean, great. And like, I don't blame the publisher for trying to sell books, but I think critics have a weird place here that nobody ever talks about. I see the reviews and I'm like, I can see the name of the writer and I know how they're going to review this book every single time. I'm not saying critics have this great power to change the way books, they are, I think, abdicating some of the critical faculties when it comes to these books. And I suppose what seemed interesting is it's, it's satirizing this idea that, as I understand it, you know, people are kind of profiting off the spectacle of like the pain. I mean, if, if effectively people are like the entertainment is literally these imprisoned black people like fighting in gladiatorial combat, then and then that's being broadcast. You know, it's it's essentially it is about this kind of weird spectatorship of suffering in some sense. So it's almost as if it's hinting at its own status. I remember like I pick up these books and obviously it's important to think about audience when you're writing. But when it comes to these books, like it's so honed in to like, you know, the audience and, and obviously I can't say what a writer is trying to do when they write their novel, but it's impossible that every single book we read by a person of color is this tragic tale of woe without any, without any humor, like any kind of like beauty in it. I know it's not the case because I hear from writers all the time who want to, who are, who want to write these stories that, that, that yes, have trauma, have these, you know, really important themes, but also have something else in there. And I'm not sure like when that's going to, I mean, to me, it goes back to just this actual makeup of the institutions. Like if you look at, it's like 80% young white women. And those are just the numbers. Like people say that, like, you know, they get mad. I'm like, no, it's just the numbers. It wouldn't be a problem if they had any kind of diversity of thought, you know, with the same kind of stories. And I think if you bring it up, there is that discomfort because it is a weird kind of thing that you get these books by these people of color that are all sad and, you know, kind of, you know, based on misery. Like it is a weird thing. You brought up Jenna Bush Hager, who is host of the Today Show and has come to fulfill a similar uh, function as Oprah and being a, a tastemaker for fiction. Interesting aside, I had a professor at one point who was like on the who was on the advisory board that gave Oprah advice on what fiction to recommend. <laughs> um, but you know, and and Oprah, it's interesting. I mean, she she, she made some interesting choices back in the day. I don't, I don't know more recently. You know, so Jenna Bush Hager, of course, the scion of the the illustrious Bush family. So from the sort of inner core of the old like wasp American establishment, right? Who's part of this kind of revolving door that Michael Lind had a piece for us about, you know, how the American elite functions, right? And and it's kind of this thing about how like you can be a politician and then, you know, you can have a best selling work of fiction, or you can be an actor who has a best selling work of fiction, or you can have be a politician who becomes a professor or an MSNBC pundit or whatever. So it's kind of this like once once you're in, there are all these different uh, position. So, I mean, a Bush, one of the Bush twins who I remember when they were uh, in the, well, actually, I remember when she got in, didn't she get in trouble for like having a fake ID or something in college? I can't remember. They were like, yeah, they were partying for a long time. It feels like it's amazing that she, she like has become like this like arbiter, like American fiction, which is like really telling that like, obviously her like audience isn't reading, you know, widely, but like, you know, they will read what she says. So that, yeah, it's really telling about like what's happened to American fiction and who's reading American fiction like in large numbers, which is not a great thing where if like, you know, Jenna Hager is like picking books. So, and, and that sort of, I suppose, goes to the other side of the literary industry, which is the more, the more kind of commercial facing side where, you know, it kind of has this, this aspect that's just about accruing prizes, residencies, you know, positions on, you know, or like visiting writer positions at universities, things like that. So there's that, which is all, you know, is, is largely a, um, traffic and prestige. And then there's kind of the side that actually has to do with selling books and those, you know, overlap somewhat. You can have best-selling books, but zero prestige in that world. And you can also have quite a bit of prestige in that world and and your books don't really sell much. This particular book and, and you know, several of these ones you're describing are kind of in that, you know, in the middle of the Venn diagram where they seem to be getting. Yeah, this book was amazing that, yeah, it'll probably win that book award. It's one of the prizes and it's a massive bestseller. So it was able to find that perfect kind of sweet spot that, like every year you get one or two of those at perfect sweet spot. And what I will say about these writers, like even if you're trying to do that, that's still hard to land in that sweet spot. So I tip my hat to them to like be able to, you know, win the awards and like, you know, get the, you know, Bush Hager crowd, you're set for life. 
What I think happens though is that like it's rare to get this, but writers see this brass ring that they want to chase. So I think like we do lose talented writers every year who are working on a novel or collection of stories that that are actually an important book from a POC perspective. And then they go on the agent search or they get an agent and they go to the editor. And that's when the book starts to get kind of, that to me is a big problem that people in publishing have been trained for the last 10 years to not know how to deal with books that are in these gray spaces, these gray areas. Even with the Hobart thing, what I noticed there was fascinating. People said they didn't really have trouble with what I said. It was the way that I said it. And that's a really weird kind of, because like the way I talk in Miami might be a crude way. Obviously, I don't write that way because there's a white audience that might not like it. But like, that's just the way people can talk if they're from, you know, areas that aren't, you know, kind of literary. So like, even that's a basic, I think, massive class difference that we see. So like, you can write the right kind of topic, but if the language is off in a way, you will encounter editors who just don't know how to deal with that because they don't hear it. I think this can be fixed if publishing becomes an actual inclusive space, but it's so expensive. To become an editor or an agent, you have to go to some like publishing program that costs like 80 grand a year. Who can do that? I think so much of what we're talking about is always a class thing that nobody wants to talk about. Like these are really closed off kind of institutions that like even the people of color who like get into them are people who are kind of already well off that they're kind of in the second, third generation. If you're somebody like in Miami who just wants to write short fiction, but you didn't come from these spaces, you truly have no idea how to get into them. And that's the problem. And if you do get into them, then you realize, oh shit, if I want to publish or have success, I really have to kind of just write a certain kind of story. So much of it is just, if you want to talk about class, people in that world, for obvious reasons, are going to resist. And even this piece, this piece was published today. It's doing well, but you can tell the people that are reading it and the ones that certainly have read it, but are not going to talk about it or tweet it. And it's the people who are like in that world, who know that it's true that one or two might reach out privately, but there'll be no even acknowledgement of the piece because you can't acknowledge this massive elephant. There's a massive class differential here. Right. And I mean, I guess Jenna Bush is kind of a good illustration in in a really blatant way that (laughs) just kind of pure Nepo baby. But a lot of these institutions, they don't, I mean, I know people who work in, you know, various related fields and they don't pay particular. I mean, publishing notoriously in New York City pays very poorly. You know, entry level sort of editorial assistant jobs are like thirty. You know, let's say like thirty thousand or forty thousand a year, which is you know is is really not an income you can live on in, in New York City, unless of course you have parental support. And um, yeah, beyond that, a lot of what they do is pay. And you know, this is to do with writers more, but like a lot of a lot of the currency is prestige rather than money. Very hard to make your way in, in any part of that world if you're not if you don't have several legs up as far as you know being able to have a, have other sources of income that will allow you to have the luxury of of being paid in in prestige rather than or you know do unpaid internships, work these crappy low level publishing jobs. I mean, the the world is full of kind of mini. Jenna Bush Hagers and that, you know, the vast majority of them have that family background that allows them to, uh, you know, gain entry into the world often, but also be able to exist within it because it really doesn't, it really doesn't pay a sustainable living to most people. I'd be curious in the next like two or three years, because we are, we are like seeing some books now they're talking about these things. There's a book coming out in March called Victim by a friend of mine. And it's kind of, I haven't read it yet, but it's like dealing with these kind of issues and it's out with a big press. So I'm curious to see what happens there. Like if there is some kind of, now uh, there's a movie coming out. I saw a trailer today. It's about the Percival Everett book that kind of deals with these like topics of like writing for like this, like, you know, white audience. So like, like there is a mainstream. So that's happening now. So I'd be curious to see like, if that is some kind of small tipping point toward an understanding that, okay, like for the last 15 years, this has been going on. Let's try to kind of reckon with this and we'll see. I'm not sure. Like, I think we'll see some more of that as a release valve. But I don't think we'll see like you know more books that are just like you know like an honest depiction of like you know working class like POC or even white characters. So in the short term and predictions, do you expect that the the book you mostly discussed, uh, which is Chain Gang All Stars by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya, people want to look that up? Uh, do you expect that that will win the the National Book Award for which it's been nominated? Or? I think it has to win at this point. The way it's been kind of framed, like, I think it has to win. It's the favorite. That's for sure. Well, we shall see, and uh, we will definitely circulate your piece again once that award is announced, I believe, in, in early November. We will be, be waiting with bated breath. Anyway, thanks, Alex. Uh, great to talk. Thanks, Jeff. And this has been this week's Compact Conversations. 
As always, remember Compact is an independent reader-supported publication. We need your subscriptions to keep doing what we're doing. Please subscribe for only $9 a month or $90 a year to get full access to all of our content, including Alex's most recent piece, as well as invitations to in-person events coming up, definitely some coming up over the next six months to a year. And also please remember to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite channels. And if you like what you're hearing, give us five stars. Thanks again.